I see Toto has disappeared. He's underneath. very far away. He's on a pillow right here. Just, <laughs> somehow it's hard for me to get us both on the camera without cutting off. Oh, that's all right. If he wants to nap, he can go ahead. Well, he's uh, he does a lot of that. But for right now, he's um, just content to lay here. Well, it is a dog's life. Yes, a dog's life is very easy. A, a kind of a snapshot of it. Um, yesterday, he got to go for a ride, which is quite the thrill, didn't you? Oh, why he, did you see how he perks up at the word ride? I said ride, didn't I? Ah. I did. <laughs> yeah. That made, that made you sit up. Well, we're not going to do that quite right now. But yeah, we had errands to run that mostly involved drive throughs He doesn't like to be left alone in a car, so we don't do anything that involves getting out of the car. But if we're at drive throughs or if there's two of us and one can stay and one can leave, we that that's doable. All right, it's almost 10. I think you're really going to enjoy the session today. Um, it has a it has a clarity that many of of, of uh, Mark's chapters lack. You know, Mark likes to keep us wondering and pondering, and doesn't want us to get to the end of things too quickly. He tells a lot of parables because he wants us to take the long way around to make sure that we understand things. Today, uh, I think the time's growing short, and uh, he kind of gets to the point. Uh, in a way that he doesn't always. So it's time to say our prayers. So you know the drill. I'm going to uh, call upon different holy ones to be with us and to be with you wherever you are. If you'd like to add to that aloud, then just unmute yourself long enough to call on and invite whomever you would like. Okay, we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Remember, especially when we cross across our heart and lungs, and ask for the spirit to be present. It's the uh, the breath of God, the living presence of God inside of us. So we never never need to think of the body of Christ and those who belong to it as being far away. They're as close to us as our next breath. And so we invite in and around us, St. Michael the Archangel. Michael, we're grateful for your loving protective presence. Please stand guard over us and keep us safe from any who would distract or do us harm. We call on Holy Mary and St. Joseph. This feast was yesterday. Please come and be with us. We call on Mark and everyone who had a role in getting this story uh, to us in the form that we have it through the oral tradition or in editing or in any part in its composition. We call on everyone who populates the story, the gospel according to Mark, everyone named and unnamed. All those who've had a particular love for this gospel throughout the centuries. Call on um, St. Dominic and St. Francis, St. Mary Magdalene, St. Rose. on the members of our family lines, those that we've uh, overlapped with and those who preceded us, any who are in the light who would like to join us. And I invite your prayers. St. Catherine of Stanis. St. Claire of Assisi. Saint Joseph. We call on all the saints and all the holy ones. Anyone who would like to join us and be a part of our spiritual journey, Holy Spirit, we ask that you give us gracious speaking, gracious listening especially gracious direction that we might be in the flow of your deepest desire for this hour that we spend together today. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. All righty. Chapter 12 today. 
12 of 15. So we're getting near the end. In fact, we're, uh, we're in Jerusalem. We uh, crossed in and out uh, in chapter 11. Now we're, we're in the Holy City, which is also going to be the uh, place where it all goes down. Um, Sammy, uh, is it in the chat, the, the document you were talking about? Yes, it is. Okay. Can everybody see a document in, in the chat? It's you called be able to view it. Chiasm in <clears throat> Mark 12. It'll copy and paste the link for you, and then you'll have to paste it in your browser, or at least that's how it worked for me. And then you can download it and open it in Word, whatever you want to do. I can just show it on my screen. I double clicked it and it came up just fine. Okay. Double click the link and chat. We don't see it at all. It's look in the chat and it should be there. If you don't see it, we we'll just we can put it onto the screen too. Yeah, I'll put it on the screen right now. It'll make it easier. Uh, hang on, just one second. Okay, you should be able to do it, Father Nathan. Do you see it now? Try sharing your screen. Link. If it doesn't work, I can do it. I can share the screen. <laughs> there you go. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. All right. All right, uh, what I'm going to do, the, the entire chapter is one great big chiasm. Um, and it's organized, as you can see, a, B, C, D, C, B, A, right? So what, and I, I, I've created a structure for it, but I wanted to kind of be fill in the blank. So I'm gonna get us started, but I want you to be thinking, if you were teaching this class, uh, how would you capture section A versus one to nine in a phrase or two? What's the theme of it? What is it about? Remember from last time, we had um, Jesus arriving, Jesus and his followers arriving. They were in the outskirts of Jerusalem. At one point, they were across the valley over on the, the Mount of Olives. Um, they enter, go in, go out, go in, go out. There's the issue of the, uh, the fig tree that from a distance looks like it's gonna feed you because it's all green and leafy. When you get up close to it, it has no fruit. Uh, that's an image of the temple from a distance. It's it glistens and uh, it, it's such a magnificent building, a religious edifice. Uh, it looks from a distance like it's gonna feed your spiritual needs, but when you approach it, it you, you're left hungry. And Jesus curses it and it and says, it's not the season for this, or the, the, the author told us it wasn't the season for figs. So it's it's not the season for the temple anymore, but here we go, we're in, in uh, chapter 12. And he's, He's on the turf of the very people who didn't receive the seed because as soon as it was sown, it was eaten up by the birds. The ones that it was sown to them, but it was by the way, uh, it, the seed disappeared almost immediately. They they never really had much of a chance at receiving it because of where they were, how they were positioned. He began to address them once more in parables. Okay, again, remember the whole point of a parable is not to get you from point A to point B as fast as you can go. It takes you from point A to point B, but it's a great big arc because you need to ponder and experience things and not jump to conclusions. You can't read the book by its cover. You need to experience the story. So it's a parable of the tenants. Um, would one of you, um, Dasha and Anjay, do you have a Bible with you? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we do. We have Polish and, and English. All right, why don't you use the Polish one? That'll be a little different. 
and we won't understand a word you're saying, but maybe you maybe you could do both or something. But would would you look up um, Psalm? No, excuse me, Isaiah chapter five one to seven. Oh, I don't have the Old Testament with me. Uh, but I, I have, I have it. One second, Isaiah. Do you have it in English? Yeah, I have it in yeah. English. I'm just. All right, Isaiah five one to seven. Go ahead and look that up. Daffrey, do you have a Bible with you? Yeah. Five to seven. I do. Five one to seven. Daffrey, would you get? Would you uh, tee up um, Psalm one eighteen? And I'll call on you a little later. One of the downsides of having this document on my screen is it reduces the number of you that I can see. So, but you're you, you two happen to be on my screen. Anyway. <laughs> He begins to address them once more in parables. Um, remember, somebody's having coughing or clearing their throat. Be, uh, be sure to mute yourself if you need to do that. Otherwise, it's broadcast all over the planet. You can be heard in uh, the UK where Aram is. He began to address them once more in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a hedge around it, dug out a vat, and erected a tower. He leased it to tenant farmers and then went on a journey. In due time, he dispatches a man in service to the tenants to obtain from them his share of the produce from the vineyard. Okay, so let's pause just a second. He's telling a story about uh, some guy who plants a vineyard. The guy puts a hedge around it. The point of that is to keep animals from coming in and eating up everything. So he puts a hedge around it, digs out a vat. It's a vineyard, so that's where the wine, the grapes are going to be crushed. He erects a tower both to oversee the operation and maybe to keep out uh, uh, adversaries. But then he goes on, a, he leaves it to tenant farmers to be in charge of it and then goes on a journey. But in due time, he dispatches a man in his service to go to the tenants to obtain from them his share of the produce from the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him and sent him off empty handed. The second time, he sent them another servant. That one too, they beat over the head and treated shamefully. He sent yet another and they killed him. So too with many others. Some they beat, some they killed. Still, he had one to send, the son whom he loved. He sent him to them as a last resort, thinking they will have to respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, here's the one who will inherit everything. Come, let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. Then they seized him, killed him and dragged him outside the vineyard. What do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do? He'll come and destroy those tenants turn his vineyard over to the others. Okay, that's section one, A. It starts with, he began to address them. And who is the them from the previous uh, chapter? Um, we'll go back to chapter, at the end of chapter 11, they returned once more to Jerusalem, the third time they enter. And he was walking in the temple precincts with the chief priests, the scribes and the elders. So it's a conglomeration of everybody in religious authority in Jerusalem and in the temple complex. He begins to address them once more in parables. So you've heard the story and you see the little handout there. What would you put on the blank line? How would you describe this section in a phrase or two? I might use those words that you used, um, that they use in Isaiah, which is the unfruitful vineyard. It is the parable of the wicked tenants, but it is, I think the emphasis is on, is on sort of the, the hard heartedness, the lack of fruit, and it kind of touches back on the fig tree as well, I think. All right. So give us that in a phrase again, please, Aaron. Um, the unfruitful vineyard. Unfruitful vineyard. All right. 
or like the parable that. of the wicked tenants. Yeah, it gets, it gets often called in, in my Bible. Remember, those little subtitles in the Bible are not original to the text. They're, they're medieval. Uh, mine is called the parable of the tenants, but I, I like yours better. Say it one more time. The unfruitful vineyard. The, un, the parable of the unfruitful vineyard. All right. That's very fitting. It goes back to chapter four, the parable of the sower and the seed. Three out of the four options in that parable uh, don't yield fruit for one reason or another, but one of them does. So now, Dasha, are you ready with um, Isaiah 5? Yes, yes, I have it. All right, would you, um, let's see, what I need is, um, from the beginning of the chapter, um, let's see, just start from the beginning and I'll let you know when to stop, please. <clears throat> from number one, right? Yes, chapter five, verse one, let me now sing. Let me, let me now sing of my friend, my friend's song concerning his vineyard. My friend had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He spaded it, cleared it of stones, and planted the choicest vines. Within it, he built a watchtower, and he hewed out a vine press. Then he looked for the crop of grapes, but what, he, what it yielded was wild grapes. Now inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, Judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I had not done? Why, when I looked for the crop of grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? Now I will let you know what I mean to do in my vineyard. Take away its hedge, give it to grazing, break through its wall, let it be trampled. Yes, I will make it a ruin. It shall not be pruned or hoed, but overgrown with thorns and breeze. I will command the clouds not to send rain upon it. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his cherished. He looked for judgment by sea, bloodshed, for justice by heart, the outcry. Okay, thank you. If you go on, it goes on to a section talking about uh, ruined buildings. Um, it's, it's clear that he's addressing this to the, the conglomerate, the same way at the beginning of Isaiah 5. Um, it, well, in what is it? Uh, chapter, verse 3, 5 3. Now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah. So it's a collective. In Mark, 12, it's, he, he is addressing the, those in the temple precincts, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Later, remember, it's going to be whole crowds of people shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Mark is going to use the word panta, which P-A-N-T-A, which means all, total, uh, another collective, that, that the rejection of Jesus is pretty much across the board, that uh, it, it's cosmic. Well, for anyway, what, so what he's doing right now, Mark is taking us back to Isaiah 5. It's very plain, isn't it? Can't you see the, the parallel between the two? It's almost word for word. He's using this parable. Uh, inside of it, uh, he gives this example of, of the vineyard owner. There's a way in which, uh, even though I started us with prayer, trying to emphasize, pay attention to the fact that the spirit of God is in your body, in your pulmonary system. Isn't it true for all of us? Don't you ever sometimes feel like God is far away? Do you ever have unsatisfying experiences of prayer when you feel like you're talking to the wall? Or you wonder why God's not doing what you want because you were told to pray uh, with, with fervor and repetition and then you do it and you don't see any result. It's like when Jesus was asleep in the boat, remember? They had to wake him up and say, don't you care that we're dying? So this touches upon that very human experience of um, the 
conundrum of believing that you're, the kingdom of God is in your midst, that God is with us, but on the other hand, feeling like you're not being heard or that God is far away. So there's this feeling that's very, very commonplace of the vineyard owner being absent. God creates a vineyard and then goes away and it doesn't say where or why or when he's coming back. There's just this sense of absence and somebody else being kind of commissioned to be uh, the middleman or the, or the one in charge during the owner's absence. The owner stays interested in the vineyard from a distance and keeps sending different emissaries uh, asking for fruit from, from the vineyard. It, there's no fruit forthcoming, it gets worse. Look at verse four, they, the second time they sent another servant, him too they beat over the head and another they killed. Can you think of somebody in the narrative earlier uh, where the word head is important and killed is important? Can you think of somebody who was killed by a blow to the head? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. He lost his head completely. Uh, so John the Baptist, and they, remember when Jesus keeps asking, who do they say that I am? They, they often name prophets. If they don't say the, a prophet by name, they at least say one of the prophets and many of the prophets were murdered because the messages that they brought very often, century after century, not in just any one time, were, I left you in charge, but you instead have um, debauched my temple or uh, you've, you've, not, you've been uh, unconcerned about cruelty to the poor. The prophets often have a, a chastising message and when they, when they do their jobs, they're then told, uh, or they're, they're then either threatened or killed. Toto needs to leave the room, so hang on a second. See you later. Thanks for being with us. Okay, so that's, um, and then they, there's this very unlikely thing at, um, they've killed, they've beaten, killed, so on. It doesn't exactly say beheaded, but putting head and killed in within a few words of each other kind of evokes John the Baptist. Uh, and then at, for some reason, he sends the son whom he loved. The vineyard owner sends the son whom he loved. Well, you don't have, you'd have to be pretty thick to not get it by the time you've been studying Mark all along. Who's the son that he loves? It's, it's Jesus at the baptism. Jesus. You are my child, my beloved, I'm thrilled with you. It's Jesus at the transfiguration with Moses and Elijah. This time, not it, not a, a direct address, this time a proclamation. This is my son, my beloved, listen to him. And you know that I'm, I've been trying to drive home the point that Mary Dial, Kate Oms, that's you too. Because the spirit of the Lord entered you, first of all, at your birth, because you're made of the stuff of God, secondarily at your baptism, because the, the ones in charge of you or you yourself, if you did it as an adult said, I want to belong. I, I, I understand that I'm invited and I belong. I'm part of the body of Christ. So the, he, the one he sends, the one whom he loves, he, he says as a last resort, they'll have to respect my son. What does that tell you about the father? I'm going to get rid of, um, of the uh, the document for Sammy. Can you do that for me? Can you make the document go away so I can see the gallery view? I can try. Just a second. There we go. I'm used to being in front of a crowd, COVID or not, and <laughs> I just need to see your faces to to do what I do. Um, there, there. What does it say to you about the father, the voice, 
who says, you are my child, my beloved. This is my son, my beloved. Listen to him. What does it tell you about the one we call God, the father, the creator, the first person of the Trinity? When Mark does a very unmarked thing, he brings us into somebody else's mind and tells us what they're thinking. He hardly ever does that. John does it all the time. But for Mark, this is a very uncommon thing to take the reader inside the thoughts of another, this time of the vineyard owner. They will have to respect my son. Why? And does that make any sense to you? They've, they've beaten, killed, and beheaded a whole sequence of people that I've sent. But then, then the vineyard owner says, they'll have to respect my son. I just think it's very dear that, that the creator just doesn't give up on us, even in the face of uh, every reason to, to see a pattern and think that we won't care. They'll have to respect my son. But instead, those tenants said to one another, here's the one we'll inherit everything. Hey, let's kill him and take his stuff. Now, does that make any sense? Does the fact that you kill someone who was going to inherit mean you're going to get their stuff? Is that the way inheritance works? If, if you know that somebody's about to come in to a big windfall because of inheritance, would you go kill them so you'd be next in line? It's crazy. But there's an element of, of, of irrationality to this whole nonsensical business. But they think, well, we'll kill him and his inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and dragged him outside the vineyard. What significance will, what will be the parallelism between the parable and what will happen to Jesus with regard to being dragged outside the vineyard? Carol, do you remember? You're not, you're up. You're muted. There, um, well, there is a kind of anticipatory parallelism here. Um, God the Father, knowing what will happen to his son. But that's what I don't understand. The vineyard owner seems mistaken in thinking that his tenants will respect his child. But God would knowingly sacrifice his son. So I'm not sure exactly how to put the two stories together. Here's the way I put it together. God, the father just has um, eternal, unfathomable hope in us that keeps hoping and hoping and hoping that uh, eventually we will um, bear fruit, that eventually we'll accept the love because it's given to all of us. That if he says it enough times, maybe one of the times we'll hear it. Elaine, you are my child, my beloved. <laughs> if, if he has to say it for all eternity and you've had any trouble hearing it, well, he'll just keep saying it. it I just think it's, an, it's a, a sign of e eternal hope that things can be different than the way they are. But remember, outside the vineyard or outside the walls has a particular importance because when we get to Jesus's um, death sentence, when he's judged, not only is he going to be crucified, but crucifixion couldn't happen inside the walls of the holy city because it would defile the holiness of the city. So the convicted one is gonna to have to carry his cross on what we call the Via Dolorosa, the way of the cross. The, the, it, we have it kind of romanticized in a prayerful format of the Stations of the Cross, but practically the point was he could not be um, crucified. Remember crucifixion was a Roman torture uh, to begin with and, and the Jewish authorities didn't have the power to sentence anyone to death under Roman um, occupation. The Romans had to pronounce a death sentence and it was a Roman death. It, and he had to carry his cross outside the walls to the Mount of Olives, the, or 
what is it called? Uh, uh, the place of the skull. So that there's that resonance in that he's gonna, they seized him, kill him and drag him outside the vineyard. What do you suppose the owner of that vineyard's gonna do? Will it come and destroy those tenants and turn the vineyard over to others? All right. The the uh, remember three years ago, where if we're reading this in the year 70, three years ago the temple was scraped off the temple mount and not one stone was left upon a stone. The entire massive edifice was collapsed by the Romans. It shouldn't be too difficult for us to think back to 9-11 to have a little bit of an appreciation for something so shocking. Although the Twin Towers were kind of a temple of commerce, that was why they were the target that they were. Uh, it's not the same as uh, for Catholics losing the entire Vatican and the Sistine Chapel and the whole thing or or for Mormons losing the entirety of, uh, of the temple of the Mormon temple or it's it's all it's in, it's the whole thing's just it, gone 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 and then people having to put together what in the world happened why did that happen well, anyway here's uh let's go into b in the on the handout uh if you want if uh, i don't know whether you can see it or not but if you don't have it uh, on a pad next to you uh section b in this chiasm starts at verse 10. Jesus has just said they'll come and destroy those tenants and turn the vineyard over to others. Aren't you familiar with this passage of scripture? And that's where we need um, Psalm 118. Who did I give that to? Daffrey, was that you? Okay. No, 118. 118? Thank you. 110. 110? Yes, 110. Did I oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, you don't mean to be sorry. You said you were following directions. Um, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Uh, okay. Till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your foes. Force force dominion on the day you lead your host in holy splendor. From the womb of the morning, I begot you. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay, the that's, Lord, good. that's good enough right there. There's, okay. this, there's this passage where, remember the, the, um, the, the Psalms are credited with having been written by King David. Oh. The whole book of Psalms is credited to David. The way the first five books of the what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, are credited to Moses, even though Moses dies in the fifth book, he's still kind of given credit for having composed the first five books, or at least his name kind of honorarily gets attached to them. In the same way, David was a king, and kings often had courtiers who included um, bards, authors, musicians. And so there's a kind of a Davidic theatrical troupe or musical troupe that writes, that's credited with writing all the Psalms, but David is considered their author. So David is saying to you, the Lord, that is the creator, God of all, said to my Lord, the one who has more status than I, the one who outranks me, the Lord of all says to the one who outranks me, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The scepter of your power, the Lord will stretch forth from Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Yours is princely power in the day of your birth and holy splendor. Before the day star, like the dew, I have begotten you. The Lord has sworn and he will repent you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So there's this odd thing. You've got King David in that Psalm 110, referencing the one who has more power than he, his Lord. He serves in a theocracy. So he's God's agent. And he understands himself to be under the authority of the Lord of all. He's the king of Israel, but he exists in a hierarchy that his authority comes from the God who created all. King David says, the Lord 
said to my Lord, and then he starts speaking about someone who hasn't even been born yet, somebody who's going to be among his progeny. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand, I will make your enemies your footstool. See all of these, all of this is in the future tense, the scepter of your power, the, the Lord will stretch forth from Zion, you will rule in the midst of your enemies, yours will be princely power in the day of your birth. Uh, so in that Psalm, David calls the creator his Lord, but then he also uses the word Lord to speak of somebody who hasn't even been born yet, who's going to be one of his descendants in the future. Okay. If you don't get that, don't be ashamed to raise your hand and make me repeat it. The Lord of all says to me, the king, and then Dave, King David refers to somebody else as his Lord who will be in his family line. Can you imagine yourself thinking about your, if you have children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, somebody who's more important than you, somebody who hasn't even been born yet, who will be part of your line. And I don't have offspring of my own. There's some of you who don't have a child of your own or, or whatever. Um, you belong in a, in a line. In a, and I often pray to my family line and acknowledge that I know that you're there. Would you come and be with me? There's somebody in King David's future that he's, he addresses as Lord. Now look back at Mark chapter uh, 12, uh, 12, verse 10. Aren't you familiar, he's saying to the, the owners of the vineyard, the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, aren't you familiar with this passage of scripture? And he's quoting it back at them. The stone rejected by the builders has become the keystone of the structure. It was the Lord who did it. And we find it marvelous to behold. Flip over to verse 35, which in the chiasm is going to be the matching section to this. We'll go to in, into it uh, a little bit later, but I want to bring it forward right now. As Jesus was teaching in the temple precincts, he went on to say, how can the scribes claim that the Christ is David's son? Because that was the teaching. They were supposed to be looking forward to the Christ, the Messiah, would be David's son. Remember, in both Matthew and Luke's gospel, we get genealogies, and both of them in different ways are there to prove that the baby of Mary and Joseph qualifies as Davidic. There's long genealogies at the beginning of Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel, both of which show that Jesus belongs to the line of David. Mark doesn't give us that. But the, the expectation that the, one of the first uh, criteria for being even thought of being the Messiah would be that it had to be from the line of David. So Jesus is teaching in the temple precincts and goes on to say, how can the scribes claim that the Christ is David's son? David himself inspired by the Holy Spirit. And then he quotes Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Here's the clincher. If David himself addresses his offspring, the Messiah, as Lord, in what sense can he be his son? The majority of the crowd heard this with delight. So anyway, those two match. Back to uh, verse uh, 10. The stone which has been rejected by the builders has become the keystone of the structure. It was the Lord who did it, and it's marvelous to behold. Here it is at Psalm, um, let's see, Psalm 118. Yeah, it's sometimes called 118. It's 118, thank you, Aaron. I'm at uh, Psalm 118, verse 19. It's, this is a psalm that would have been used by pilgrimage groups. Imagine yourself being on a pilgrimage. I mean, any more they involve planes and airports and buses. But in the ancient world, it was on foot in a group. 
And when, if you were going to the Jerusalem temple on a pilgrimage, the last part of it, you'd come over a rise and you'd see Jerusalem in the distance. And the temple was so massive that you'd see it from a great distance away. And it was, it had been outfitted just in their lifetime or the previous 40 years. King Herod had done a great big campaign to get the whole thing outfitted with more and more grandeur, more and more marble. It glistened, it had, was gold gilt around the edges. The sun just beamed off of it like it was the sun itself. It looked like the light was coming from inside the temple. So they had specific psalms that would that, that would the people would start to sing when they could see it in the distance. At, because of my love for the Wizard of Oz, there's a song that matches it. When they come out of the gloomy forest, they break into song and say, you're out of the woods, you're out of the dark, you're out of the night. Step into the sun, step into the light. Stay straight ahead for the most glorious place but on the face of the earth and the stars. It, they're, they're, they're in, the, in Oz, it's an open field. It's full of poppies, but in the distance, there's this glistening temple. It's the same affect when you've been on this long journey and then man, you'd come over the hill and you can see the temple in the distance and it's glowing and you would sing a song like this. Open to me the gates of justice. I will enter them and give thanks to the Lord. The gate is the Lord's and the just will enter it. I will give thanks to you for you have answered me and you have been my savior. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. By the Lord has this been done and it's wonderful in our eyes. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and has given us light. Join in procession with leafy boughs. Leafy boughs. That was in the previous chapter, wasn't it? A procession with leafy boughs. Brought up to the altar. You are my God and I give thanks to you. Oh my God, I extol you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his kindness endures forever. So again, he's teaching scribes, Pharisees, the leaders of the temple complex and of Jerusalem. And they know these Psalms. They know these stories. They know Isaiah. They know the Psalms. And he's simply putting back in front of them what's already inside them. Aren't you familiar with this passage of scripture? The stone rejected by the builders has become the keystone of the structure. It was the Lord who did it. And we find it marvelous to behold. Now, there's two different ways that this stone thing can go. Scholars fight over it. One of them can be um, the, it can be called cornerstone. And in the ancient world and in our own time, we might have, we, when a new building is put up, sometimes there's a cornerstone and act, sometimes it really is in the facade of the building. Uh, I remember the school that I went to as a child had a cornerstone on the uh, lower left of the building. And it, it went in in 1948 when the building was built and it said, who the bishop was and who the pastor was and what the name of the construction firm was and so on. It was the cornerstone, but it was a ceremonial stone. It wasn't there to bear weight. And it was, it was prettier than all the rest of the stones so that it stood out and you paid attention to it. That's one kind of such stone. So Jesus could be that, or there's another possibility. He could be the capstone. And actually that's my preferred understanding of what this means. Think in the ancient world of, of uh, arches and how common arches were in the ancient world as a, a, a element of a building. You, uh, and the, the stones would be hewed and mostly were uh, uh, cubical. They needed to be in uniform size if you're going to build, like think of a doorway made out of stone arches, no wood, just stones. The stones had to be uniform so that one stacked upon another, okay? And then they would begin, as they begin to curve and create the arch, they would have to be a little bit different, but they'd have to be matching on both sides of the arch until they came, and remember there was no mortar. They had to be fitted together by stacking them together without any mortar holding them in between. And then when they get to the top, they have a stone that's shaped like this, a little wedge. 
that was put at the top of the arch that wedged in between the surrounding pieces and it created um, a tension that held the whole structure together. Okay, you get the idea. Can you imagine having seen such a stone at the top of an arch? Sometimes they're, um, they're there as a design element that's really not performing a function, but you see sometimes little faux sh shapes like that at the top of a doorway that harken back to that architectural design. Well, think if you're the, um, the stone cutter, you're looking for all these pieces that would be suitable for the blocks that go up the side and then the ones that come around to the edge. And when it gets time to find the one that would make the perfect wedge at the top, you don't look for the best stones, you look for the misshapen ones. Were you ever a child next to a workbench? Were you ever playing in the sawdust while somebody, one of your elders was using a saw or did you, were you ever given a piece of scrap lumber, a nail and a hammer so that you could hammer something? Did you ever make a birdhouse? No, nope. something like that. It, it has this element to it because you have to go to the junk pile. You have to go to the rubble over on the edge. And Susie, you might've been sent there. Your grandpa might've said, Susie, go over there and find me a piece about like this. And you might go around in the junk and find the, the, the wedge shaped one. See if you can find something that looks sort of like this. Right, so the stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone of the structure. I believe that's a message to Mark's brutalized bleeding community who's treated like crap. You don't belong here, we hate you. Uh, we, we murder the last of you. We'd like to get rid of the, of the whole of you, get you out of here. If you've ever been treated like you're not the right kind, you don't fit here among us. If you ever felt like you were on the junk pile, here you go. The stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone of the structure, the one who, who's, um, it reminds me of so many like children's stories. Think of the Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Um, there's probably a lot of other children's stories in that genre where the most unlikely, the little engine that could, you know, Somebody it just uh, is a misfit, the island of misfit toys uh, in that story. Jesus is a misfit among the leaders of Jerusalem. And, and we can be, yeah, the ugly duckling. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, that becomes the swan. The stone that the builders rejected becomes the cornerstone. And you, my beloved friends, you are that. And if the worst comes to the worst and you meet a fate like Jesus does and you have to carry your cross outside the walls and everybody's jeering at you all the while, just remember that you are the stone that the builders rejected that's on its way to becoming the cornerstone. I think that's the point of this. Let's get to C, we're at verse 13. They next sent, uh, they went to arrest, I need to go back to 12. It was the Lord who did this, and we find it marvelous, behold, but they wanted to arrest him at this, although they had reason to fear the crowd. They knew well enough that he meant the parable for them. Finally, they left him and went off. So Jesus is no longer in the company of the scribes, uh, the Pharisees and the elders, the chief priests, the scribes and the elders. They next sent some Pharisees and Herodians to catch him in speech. So Pharisees are, were sort of the liberal party of their day that were trying to update everything to take the tradition and make it more modern. And the Herodians, Herod is in charge up in the north, but uh, there are Herodians in town because King Herod and his group uh, are in town for the festival. There, there's, they, they next sent some Pharisees and Herodians after him to try to catch him in speech. So they're in cahoots with the priests, chief priests, scribes, and elders, they send some Pharisees and Herodians to catch him. These were people that they ordinarily fought with, but for right now, um, they're willing to work with to get rid of Jesus. The, the, you know how alliances work that way sometimes? 
people that thought think of themselves as opponents if there's yet a third party who they're even more opposed to they might for a little while align with someone that they ordinarily wouldn't um anyway they the pharisees and herodians try to catch him in speech the two groups come to him and they say first think of the visual everyone would have been wearing long robes and the Pharisees would have been wearing long robes that identified them as um, religious, sort of like me when I'm wearing my Dominican habit. In fact, when I teach this, I often teach it in my habit so that I can sort of model it because they're going to need to dig around inside their holy garments to find a coin. So they're standing there before him. They come up to him and say, teacher, we know you're a truthful man. You're unconcerned about anybody's opinion. And remember, in the previous uh, couple of sentences, they were afraid about, they wanted to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd. Well, they're saying to him, hey, teacher, we know you're a truthful man, and you don't care about what anybody thinks. Doesn't that sound like praise, Mary Jane? Except it's smarmy. Have you ever had anybody come up to you and you know that they have, they're up to no good, but they start with syrupy words? Oh, Lori, oh, Guy, I just think the world of you. Now, let me tell you this. And that, then they're going to lower the boom. Well, it's evident that you don't act out of human respect, but you teach God's way of life sincerely. We just can't say enough good things about you. Now, is it lawful to pay the tax to the emperor or not? Are we to pay? Knowing their hypocrisy. Remember, hypo, like a hypodermic needle, is a needle that goes under the skin. Hypo means under. Cretus is a mask. Like tra uh, uh, triumph or uh, uh, what is it? Tragedy and comedy. Uh, a mask that an actor would put on to go into a role. They're not being sincere, authentic. They're under a mask. He knows their hypocrisy and he says to them, why are you trying to trip me up? Asking this question about, should we pay the tax to the emperor or not? How would that work anyway? What if he said, no, don't pay your taxes? They, they're trying to paint him into a corner. Lisa, why don't you pipe in? He would be reported to, uh, he could be reported to authorities that he tells people not to pay taxes. Exactly, that's, that's exactly. And then what if he says, absolutely pay your taxes? Dasha, you're already talking. Can you finish the thought? And the would... Yes. Uh, well, he, uh, he will show the Jews that it's uh, OK to have uh, Roman oppression. The, the and, Roman you know, the it's against their own uh, religion to, to acknowledge, you know, the Caesar as a God. It's one thing to pay taxes for which you get some sort of just return, like police protection and fire protection and roads and, and good order. It's another thing when the taxes are going to a foreign country so that people there can live it up on your hardship. Yes. And the, it's like cooperation with the oppressor. What's that? Like cooperation with the oppressor. Yeah, it's exactly. That's very well said. It it would be it would mean cooperation with the oppressor. So this is a case of Jesus being damned if you do and damned if you don't. They ask him a question that has two possible answers, and they both will get him in trouble. But they want to get him in trouble. They want to pin him down. They they uh, they try to catch him in his speech. So it's not a fair conversation. It's not heart meeting heart. It's not ideas being exchanged. It's meanness. And it's public meanness to try to catch Jesus saying something that they can then um, foment a case against him about. Is it lawful to pay the tax to the emperor or not? Are we to pay it or not to pay? Knowing the hypocrisy, he says to them, why are you trying to trip me up? Bring me a coin and let me see it. This is the point at which he, they would have to reach into their religious garb underneath layers of holy cloth, dig into their pocket, 
And I have to do this all the time when I'm in my full habit. And sometimes I have a chasuble on it and acid, a microphone attached. If I need to get a tissue out of my pocket to wipe my nose, I've got to dig and get down in there and find, well, they have to dig in their religious garment and they find a coin. He says, bring me a coin, let me see it. Well, they brought him one. And he said to this, said to them at verse 16, whose image is this? And if it says head in your translation, I would strike through it and put the word image because that's the word imago in the Greek. Why is that important? Because, um, let's see, Ed Emke, I'm looking at your face. Would you smile for me? Now you did. What a pretty smile. Uh, Ed, uh, I don't know if you can see Ed because we see different configurations, but Ed, you're just smiling because I'm talking about you and I'm looking at you and I'm looking at an image of God because you're made in God's image. Isn't that right, Ed? Can we hear you, Ed? Would you unmute for a second? Lower left, hit the microphone, mute, unmute, see it? Well, I'm just mime it then. Oh, there you go. There we, are. there we go. Here we go. Ed Emke, are you or are you not made in the image of God? I am. I am. Beautiful. And so when we look at you, we see the image of God, do we not? Yes. We do. Thank you. You can go mute again. <laughs> Thank you for playing. And that's true for everybody on your screen. Every, every, every beautiful person, every degraded person you'll ever run across is made of the image of God. He says to them, why are you trying to trip me up? Bring me a coin. Let me see it. When they brought him one, he said, whose image is this and whose inscription? Well, the image, the face on the coin, we're used to seeing faces of important people on coinage. Whose image is this? And they say Caesar's because it's Caesar's image on the coin. And it says, and whose inscription or whose superscription, what's written on top of the coin? And Roman coinage often because they remember the Caesars were thought to be part of the pantheon of gods and goddesses. Oftentimes there'd be words on it to that effect. This is the face of this person who's a divinity, who's part of the, of the pantheon of Roman gods and goddesses, mostly gods, because most of the, I, I, there might've been a female image on a coin, but certainly there were more male images than female ones. Nevertheless, whose image is this and whose superscription? And it might've even said something about divinity on there. Caesar's. At that, Jesus says to them, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but give to God what belongs to God. All right, you remember the scene of the, what's called the, the cleansing of the temple? And he upsets the money changers booths and sends the money scattering. A lot of it would have been Roman coinage. The reason that there needed to be money changers at the gate of the temple was because you weren't allowed to bring Roman coins into the temple. And why was that true? Because they had a graven image on them of a false God. Do you remember the first commandment? I am the Lord, your God, you shall not have any graven images, you know, no false gods, right? So they were strict about that. You couldn't, if you were gonna do any commerce inside the temple, like buy turtle doves or lamb, you had to change your money at the door and turn it into temple money that didn't have an image on it of a Roman. And the money changers exacted a fee. Like when any of you uh, offer me a gift on my website, PayPal keeps 4.7% of it because they're a money changer, right? Money changers, that's what they do for a living. They exchange money, but they do so for a fee. So the, at the gate of the temple were money changers that turned Roman coins with images on them into temple coins that were pure. But who are we talking about? 
This was the Pharisees and the Herodians who postured that they were, were purer than everybody else and they were worthy of being in the temple. They were not supposed to ever let a, a, any of these coins touch them because, yeah. because they had false gods on them. But they're hypocrites. Jesus simply has to say to them, Daphne, hey, reach into your pocket and pull me out a coin. And of course they do so and they convict themselves. They're carrying around graven images and Jesus knew it and so did everybody else. He just exposes the hypocrisy of it. Okay, um, I'm gonna go about five minutes over just to get to the last point in here because we get to um, this, the Sadducees, they say some Sadducees, I'm at verse 18, who hold that there's no resurrection. This is D, this is the middle of the chiasm. So right in the middle of this story, it starts with here, and then came some Sadducees, their, Roman, their uh, temple folk also, they hold that there's no resurrection and they come to him with a question. Hey, we were left this in writing by Moses. If anybody's brother dies leaving a wife, but no child, he must take the wife and raise up seed. It gets translated produce offspring. In the Greek, it says raise up seed for his brother. Now there were these seven brothers. The eldest took a wife and, and died leaving no seed. The second took the woman. He too died childless, the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left behind any seed. Last of all, the woman died. Now at this resurrection of yours, when they all come back to life, whose wife is she gonna be? Remember, all seven married her. So they're putting, they're putting together this ridiculous example of, of, um, of different guys fighting over the same woman. You know, you're, they're trying to create this ridiculous scene of some sort of uh, fight in the afterlife, in this stupid afterlife that you believe in that we don't believe in. Whose wife is she going to be? All seven married her. And then Jesus says, you're badly misled because you fail to understand the scriptures or the power of God. When people rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but live like the angels in heaven. That is, they don't uh, propagate more. They don't have more kids. They don't give birth in heaven. They don't get each other pregnant in heaven and have more heaven babies. That's not the way it works. When people rise from the dead, they don't marry or are given in marriage, but they live like the angels in heaven. As to the raising of the dead, haven't you read in the book of Moses and the passage about the burning bush, how God told them, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. All of those are in the present tense. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Remember Jesus appeared on the mountain in the presence of Moses and Elijah, who had both been dead for centuries, but were standing there plain as day, talking right this minute. I am the God of Jacob. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. He is the God of the living, not just the dead. You're very much mistaken. He just tells him right out. The thing that you think is so true, it's just a mistake. You're mistaken. One of the scribes steps up and then when he hears them arguing, he realizes how skillfully Jesus is answering. He says to them, um, he decides to ask him, which is the first of all the commandments? Jesus replies, this in is first. And then he quotes a prayer. Can you think of a prayer you knew in preschool? Where you, if you were trained in, in, a, in a religious home or a, a, by a religious babysitter, can you remember saying any prayer? Make, how to make the sign of the cross when you didn't know where to put your hand. You know, This one was one of the first that a, a Hebrew baby, even Jesus as a child would have learned. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is Lord alone. And then think kindergarten. If I asked you, uh, if you, were you ever in kindergarten and you had to describe big, bigger, and even bigger than that? Can you imagine the little kid stretching themselves out as much as they could or standing on their tiptoes and stretching it to do big, big, bigger. Love the Lord with all your God, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And here's the second, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. This prayer was called the great Shema and uh, little Hebrew kids memorized this early, like we might have done the Hail Mary as Catholics. 
There's no other commandment greater than these. The scribe says to him, excellent teacher, you're right in saying he is the one. There is no other than he. Yes, to love him with all your heart, all your thoughts, all your strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's worth than more than any burnt offering or sacrifice. Jesus approves the insight of his answer. And then he says this, and we're going to close with this. Look me right in the eye, if you would. If you're looking down or around, look me right in the eye. You are not far from the reign of God. And imagine if, uh, if Jesus said this, it doesn't say it in the text, but I've always imagined it this way. What if he broke through social distance? Not the six feet that we've been doing during the pandemic, but even more than that. Can you think of, of somebody getting very emphatic with you looking you right in the eye and then getting close enough to you to make you wonder why are you getting so close? You guy, you Lori, you're not far from the reign of God. In fact, nose to nose, it might be about six inches. You are not far from the reign of God because I am the reign of God. And I'm gonna issue in the reign of God and you, and you don't have long to wait. You, um, you are not far from the reign of God. And however he said it, the next line says, no one had the courage to ask him any more questions. Whatever he did and however he said it, it shut everybody up. So doesn't that seem like just the place to end a lesson? I'm gonna go back over this and I'll see that you get a decent copy of the, uh, the chiasm structure thing. If I were the teacher, I wish I were, I would have had that done several days ago and you would have gotten it in your email, but I'm always climbing that hill. <laughs> I'm always trying to do a little more than I can actually get accomplished in a day. We're done for now. We're on again at the same time tomorrow. And, and Carol, you know that, that the uh, Arizona doesn't change its clocks. So we're gonna be together at 10 o'clock Arizona time, which is the equivalent of Pacific Coast time for the next six months. So uh, please in the uh, email, uh, email me with any question or comment. And uh, tomorrow I'm gonna try to see if we can get you in groups of four talking to one another. I've been getting some messages from you that I see all these faces, I wish I knew them. They look like such nice people. So I think I'm gonna try to do a little bit of tomorrow in some uh, small groups. All right, the Lord be with you. With you. Already God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen, go have a great day. God bless you. You too. Thanks, Father Nathan. Bye-bye.